Hello, everybody. Here we are again, working on Wisdom is Bliss, uh, four friendly fun facts that can change your life by me and um, Robert Thurman. <laughs> I found out that Robert is cognate of Sanskrit Ravi, which means the sun, which is really good for Leo, I think. So, uh, and um, I was a little conflicted. I was thinking, like I did the long thing on the Avatamsaka Sutra, the Flower Ornament Sutra, which was a mind blower for me to read it, actually. And then I'm thinking I will do a thing like that on the Lotus Sutra, and I'm looking at different translations to decide which one. I didn't translate it myself, unfortunately. Maybe I will if I get really <laughs> unhappy as I'm reading it. And so I thought, well, maybe I should do that rather than my own book. But um, maybe I will do this first, which might take a few months on and off. And uh, because in a way, this book took a while. It's my latest. And it is kind of, um, it packs things into, in the Tibetan sense, instead of a general sutra that is good for all Mahayana Buddhists, it packs in the Tantra. And one of the things that I'm particularly buzzed about it is that I take all the knowledge of the Tantras, which, I, which has been traditionally esoteric, and I feel licensed to do so by His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who sort of wants people to know what he doesn't want people to try to jump into Tantra. You actually really can't safely try to do Tantra unless you have a mentor. And, um, and it would, I mean, it would be very unusual if you would be safe to do that. Reason being, not anything about sex or weird rituals or anything like that. Reason being that Tantra involves working with the imagination and on a basis of a very strong self-confidence, which you have to build within a certain context. And in other words, you know, I'm Buddha or something, you work with that. But Zen a little bit does, right? Like Zen without being formal Tantra, when you sit in Zen, you are meant to think just by sitting in some brands of Zen, most brands of Zen, just by sitting, you are Buddha. And then, and then of course, you don't feel like that. And so then what you're doing then is you're working with the gap between how you feel and what the, and the reality you're trying to construct, where you are sort of bring your Buddha nature to the fore, and you have to sort of impersonate Buddha almost, you know, and it's only mental because it doesn't have Tantra's thing on even impersonating the body by re-envisioning your body, by getting into the subtle body and re-envisioning your body, which is the amazing techniques that developed in Tantra from Buddha's own time, according to us, and actually in relation to Indian tradition from ancient time, even maybe before the sort of um, um, upper caste Indians came in as migrators and conquerors into the Harappan civilization, where in the Vedic ritual context and the Vedic cult, they kind of transcended the body because it was a psychedelic cult. It was a Soma cult, pretty definitively proven Although some modern Indian Hindutva people, you know, Hindu-centric people don't like that because Soma doesn't grow in India. It grows in the Hindu Kush. It grows in Central Asia. It grows in the Arctic, uh, you know, in, the, in Siberia and places like that. And so how could their sacred Soma, and they, they have bhang and cannabis and that kind of thing in India. But which some people will argue that's what Soma is. But Soma was a true psychedelic, more a stronger psychedelic than cannabis-based ones. But anyway, that's a digression. But the point is, Lotus Sutra. So, so, uh, so yes. Yeah, so, so, so this work, Wisdom is Bliss, is uses the deep insight. I think lying in the core of Mahayana, of Theravada or Mahayana Buddhism, which is the nature of the human mind, and sort of uh, underlines the idea that the experience, or let's say the phenomenology and the psychological experience, that 
when you're blissed out, when you, when you melt into a more intense feeling of inner bliss, your intelligence sharpens enormously and your concentration sharpens enormously. And that's what the energy of the deeper transcending and transforming insights really employs. But bliss is not talked about in those in other levels of uh, in the exoteric levels so much because, you know, people will think, oh, well, they're selling candy, you know, and uh, and it doesn't work. You know, that won't work like that because people are basically adjusted and, and, and adapted to misery and life and therefore life is suffering. The fourth the first noble truth is taken by them as sort of an inevitable thing when you're here. And then maybe you can only think initially that you just get out of here and go into a plane there where there's no people and no objects and nothing that can fall on your head. And you don't have a vulnerable body. You don't have any body. So there, that's the idea of nirvana projected as a state of extinction where you just don't exist anymore, almost like really like a kind of glamorized death. And, um, and then build up from there and then talk about non-duality and Mahayana, which complicates that issue. What is that departure from this being a world of suffering? Where do you go? And then really always circling around the very difficult thing of like, you don't go anywhere, but you're here without suffering, amidst the suffering. And, and you're, only, you're only still with suffering and that others are still, you, you perceive others as suffering and you are bound to help them because you have the energy to do it and it doesn't, it doesn't hurt your bliss. In fact, it's a natural overflow of your bliss. So, so anyway, that was esoteric in the past because it was confusing to some, incredible to others and um, complicated the issue especially about people being able to get out of ego, to p get past the absolutization, the reification of ego, because both Theravada and Mahayana paths foundationally have to, you have to experience kind of letting go of your ego. You could say ego death, but it doesn't really die. But in a way, you, you might think it's going to when you let go of it. And, uh, and then it's, once you have done that, you become not someone who doesn't exist or something like the invisible man, but you become someone who then realizes that any way that you are structured as a subjectivity, it's your responsibility. You are doing that structuring. So it's not like there's an absolute structure behind it. And so then you can structure yourself as a Buddha identity within a certain contemplative context, within a sadhana context, within a performing context, within a ritual or and a visualizational context, imaginative context. And by doing that, accelerate your deployment of your subtle nervous system, subtle bodies, and much empower your imagination, and then reimagine yourself and your world in a really powerful way. And as I say, it was confusing, incredible, and dangerous to people who didn't have that foundation. However, in the modern period, I would say, and I haven't, Dalai Lama hasn't said it quite like that. All he has said at a point in his own career, in, my, in our relationship, our 60 year long relationship, where I translated some esoteric works because I was so deeply excited and interested in them. And then we decided we better not publish them. And he, he I mean, he actually, I wasn't even supposed to translate them according to his teachers, but then they, who were also my teachers, and then they said, well, if he says do it, you go ahead. And I did. But then he, then he did put a break and say, well, let's better not translate, publish it. And then at a certain point, well, we better publish it. And why? Because people already heard about all the esoteric stuff. And then they misunderstand it. And then they think it's bad because they misunderstand it. And even there may be some people, even some Tibetans, who misuse it because they don't fully understand it. And then it becomes a bad mark against the whole culture and the whole and bath and a lot of babies get thrown out with various kinds of dirty bath waters. <laughs> and so I think this has to do with the state of the world in the modern period where 
Identity resilience has become more widely known than in a very, very tiny, narrow elite of great adepts or siddhas, you know. And a lot of people kind of have different personalities in different contexts without thinking they're schizophrenic. Some are thought to be schizophrenic for that. And it's like an illness. You're supposed to have a rigid identity by older fashioned psychology. But more sophisticated ones are aware that people are different in different contexts, in the home, in the job, in, the, in, the, in relation, other relationships. And therefore, sort of the sort of world of the internet, of Facebook, of, of um, massive connectivity, sort of transnational, trans, you know, global society that is trying to be born with terrible, terrible agonies in the process, people, people who are unwilling to give up the old ways. Uh, in that context, maybe there's a deeper sort of Tibetan neuroscience and Tibetan where spirituality connects with art and the imagination and sci-fi and science. It's time that this is brought out into a wider public. So then, but there are many Buddhists not really liking that and agreeing with it. Surprising perhaps to people who are in the Tibetan Buddhist world, like people from Sri Lanka, Japan, you know, and we'll see back, there's both sides in China who are nervous about Tibetan Buddhism because they don't really like Tantra. Of course, you have Shingon School, for example, in Japan that is Tantra, although not an Excel Yoga Tantra, but the three, what are called like more foundational forms of Tantra, uh, up to Yoga Tantra, but not an Excel Yoga Tantra. And, uh, but the other people, the Pure Land Buddhists and the Chan Buddhists and the Zen Buddhists mostly don't like the Shingon. They think there's something weird about what they do. There's a lot of gulf there, and, uh, and their attitude towards Tibet is weird. So anyway, in order to sort of share with them and come back with them, I poured the, what I could, what, with the little knowledge I have learned and am reciting for people. I don't pretend that I'm master of it, but that I'm reciting for people. I'm poured into the mold of the four noble truths, the four friendly fun facts, and the Eightfold Path, especially. So that, you know, Book of the Dead knowledge is in right mindfulness or realistic, and I call it realistic mindfulness and so on. So I'm trying to knit it together into what I consider, what I pretty much can argue was the nature of Indian Mahayana Buddhism in the, in the all, all along actually, but most openly in the last five centuries of Indian Buddhism before the outside conquerors crushed it because it wasn't, it wasn't useful for them, you know, and they didn't understand what it was doing in India anyway, because they were like very fanatic monotheists. And um, so in those five centuries, there was what you could call three vehicle Buddhism, where the monastic ones knew about the tantric esoteric ones and the tantric esoteric ones honored the monastic ones and supported them and felt they had a foundational knowledge that you had to have. And then the Mahayana in between those, the, the esoteric one is in, was connects more closely with the Mahayana, but the Mahayana, contrary to Western thing, very strongly supported the monastic, which Theravada nowadays from Sri Lanka thinks is against uh, in Mahayana and they are automatically against each other, but that's not correct. They were not in the past and they really aren't now. They're really the same. They're just different levels of practice, that's all. And the, and it's a, and the, the ladder, ladders of practice in the Buddhist tradition, educational tradition, are such that you don't throw away the early rungs when you get on the higher ones. You need them even when you're on the higher rungs. And you bring them with you. Uh, and they're always valuable. And you support them, therefore, and you encourage people to get on the step, first steps. <laughs> you don't try to have them leap up necessarily. And even sometimes there are some people who naturally only want to go at some higher level. And if they are successful at that and don't endanger themselves and get confused, then in the Buddhist um, psychology, you would say they've already practiced those things very strongly in previous lives, so they don't need to do the other things. For example, there's an incident in the Vimalakirti where he comes upon 
I think Buddha's son, Rahula, or the, another one, Upali, who is the great Vinaya teacher of monastic Buddhism, of the monastic renunciative level, and um, he who was teaching a hundred or two hundred and a bunch of people in the town, uh, by Shali in his town, to become monks and uh, giving them the reasonings and the and the context of making that a priority, renunciation a priority. And Vimalakirti challenges Upali and says, well, in general, what you're teaching is, of course, correct. But in the case of this community, of this group, it's not correct. And your failure as a teacher is you don't know their previous life's experience. And a good spiritual teacher should know, they should develop clairvoyant knowledge to know previous lives of, of their students. Spiritual teacher, they should. And uh, therefore, if you do that, you would realize that in this lifetime, it is more productive for them and better for them on the path to be laymen bodhisattvas or lay women bodhisattvas and not try to be a mendicant monks or nuns. And so don't push them back, in, back, back to that elementary level that they already achieved in a previous life and let them cultivate the deeds of the bodhisattva, the compassion deeds, and deepen the wisdom of the selflessness of all things, the voidness and emptiness, go deeper into that. And Upali, upon this, this um, discourse by Vimalakirti, he realizes that Vimalakirti was right, and he, and he, and he, but it made him uncomfortable. But I guess he went back to meditate more to cultivate his clairvoyance. Everyone has the ability of clairvoyance, everyone with a human brain, in the Buddhist view, psychological view, but you have to develop it. Okay, all right, so coming back to it, we're back to wisdom is bliss, the realistic worldview, and I'm happy to do it, my book too, because this book, because when I talk about these things, I get a little more cheery. <laughs> Otherwise, when I'm walking around listening to the news and the nonsense that goes on in a confused country that thinks it's legal to lie because the First Amendment says you're free to lie, <laughs> which is confusion. Yes, you are, but you're not free to create an entire false fraud by defrauding people who think they're watching, getting information and news to lie as news. That you're not. You can lie as an individual, like, I'm just lying. I'm just saying what I say with no base up, no evidence. But if you're supposedly giving news and facts, you should not be allowed to have bandwidth to go and deceive people and create social crisis. That's completely not defended by the First Amendment, but we are, our judges are not rational, unfortunately. And they're, they are, they're partisan, and they're not properly appointed, and not properly tested, and not properly trained. So they are wrecking things. But we'll fix them slowly. It takes time. Okay, so the chapter 2, page 15, the realistic worldview. Now, this is fascinating. <clears throat> right away, the fact that this is the first branch of the Eightfold Path. And, um, and well, I'm discussing that, so I discuss that here, but, but people are, a lot of you are taught that, well, Buddhism is a way of life. Some people say, oh, well, Buddhism is meditation, a lot of people say. And, uh, but those meditative and ethical, you know, having a better way of life through ethics, uh, branches of the Eightfold Path, of the curriculum, of the super education, they are not the first step. The first step is the realistic worldview, like what is reality? So it's actually scientific and philosophical, the first step. So wait a minute, but you're not enlightened, so my first step in my curriculum is to what is reality, which is a realistic worldview? Well, yes. And uh, oh, how can that be? But wait, don't get frightened. It's not indoctrination and brainwashing, why? because you're told, right along with whatever you're taught about developing a realistic worldview, you're taught that you have to work through it using your own experience, evidence, reason, investigation, and inquiry. You can't just accept somebody telling you something and say, oh, that's what reality is. That doesn't, that's not a realistic worldview. That's just repeating, it's being a parrot. So, because the reason that, the way you're told that is it's, you're told that what reality is, is inexpressible. <laughs> it's inconceivable. Conceptual explanations, therefore, cannot convey what it is. 
all conceptual explanations can do is give you the equipment to unlearn some distorted concepts that you may have, which makes you think your reality is this weird reality where you're in this material world filled with other people and things. You're a tiny little entity within that world. You're very, very vulnerable and fragile, and you're completely separate from it. And you're really what you really are, and that's all you are, and what you think you are. And, and the world is really what it seems to you to be with your ordinary perception. And you're, you're meant to, you're given coaching as to how to question that, how to see through that, how to inquire and see if that's really so. So you're embarked on a process of reflection rather than a process of indoctrination, if you follow me. And you're told that the realistic worldview is something you have to develop, but you're encouraged that it's something you have the mental equipment to do. You are an intelligent person, you're human. And you can be reflective and you can think and you can critique your own thinking. And uh, that is your you know, absolutely special tool that you have so you can learn. And that's why the, the teaching that all you should do is meditate and don't think anything, which is, I think, even the, the Zen people early on taught that, the mindfulness people sometimes fall into that, and um, the people who think only one-pointed shamatha or concentrated type medicine, med meditations are worthwhile, who, that's all you should do, people who teach it that way. I think almost all of them don't do that now. They did when Buddhism was first getting there, and maybe some hard cases still do, but they mostly realized that because they mostly have had experience of teaching people that, and people have realized, and they have realized, that if you meditate on the basis of a confused worldview, you're just going to become more confused. You'll develop a new skill of, of sort of dropping out of thinking or something, and then feeling a little relaxed because you're not worrying, or not anxious and not thinking, and then being more egotistical, actually, which therefore has put you in a worse situation. And, you know, the leaders of many meditation cults who then get very egotistical when they become the boss, they have shown that to be the case in, in a number of instances. I won't, I don't want to deal with it. So realistic worldview is first. When Buddha felt the bliss of the experience of the full understanding of reality, how do I know that? I want to say that? Well, that's what they say. And I've had enough bliss of, an, of a tiny flashes and tiny experiences of some understanding of reality. And I have the rational inference of what reality is, should, seems to where it seems to lie. And so on that basis, I think I can say that confidently, that he did feel bliss. <laughs> he did smile, apparently. It's reported as having smiled anyway. He immediately saw what had been wrong with him up to that moment. So there you see it's a critical process, even in that highest moment. There's a, it's like a critical thing. He, you know, when you, to realize freedom, you have to know what prison you were in, and you have to be able to open the door to get out of that. And, that's, and, then, and then especially if the state of freedom is only in negation, you're only saying something negational. You're saying it by contrast with states of imprisonment. You're saying freedom. You're not trying to say that the word freedom somehow gives closure of what is there. No, because it's an opening. So it doesn't, it's not a closure that it, it results in. It's an expansion and an opening. And so I've had a bit of opening that I've had. So I can confidently, and it cheered me up. So I can confidently say that infinite opening will be infinitely cheery. Okay, it only flows logically. And on that basis, I say it. Of the full understanding of reality, because the full understanding, again, you know, when you fully understand something, when is it that you fully understand it? Well, you can tell someone else something about it. You can give a conceptual description of something that happened to you. But then, unless you're a poet, even if you're a poet, you know that anything you express about it will not convey the full thing. And so you do your best as a poet or as a scientific describer to describe it rationally or poetically, um, you know, evocatively. Um, but uh, you know that nothing, you, you, you created maybe a flash in another person. You maybe create an orientation where they can look. But you know you can't just reproduce your experience. Possible.
because your experience went beyond your description. But, and it's not that complicated. You eat an apple, a delicious apple, a delicious, delicious apple. And it's so juicy, and it's just right, and it's cool, and it's, you're hungry, and it's sweet, and it's not overripe and not underripe, and mm, you get lost in the juices and the texture of the flesh of the apple, and the, and the, the skin has not been DDT'd or some, horribly <laughs> some horrible chemical, so even it is tasty and a little chewy. And it's just, you get lost in that, and you kind of just do it. You are it. You get mmm, you might say, but all you can express is mmm, mmm, <laughs> delicious. And it's a non-dual experience. You are the eating, you know it by being, by eating it. And then you say, that was a delicious apple. You can say, I bought this, cost that much, here's this many ounces, but by scientific description, you can say the apple was like, the god, here are the famous golden apples she brought to Zeus, or you know, blah, blah, whatever. You can say other things that are evocative of something great, but you just know that eating it is not anything that you could describe. It's indescribable, right? So nirvana is like that. It's indescribable. So you can't, so nobody's making dogmas here, okay? So, he knew it was the same thing that is wrong with most other people. And that, namely, that they are confused. That they wrongly think they know something. And that's why, actually, ignorance is not a good translation for avidya. Because the great commentators all translate avidya. Vidya means science, knowing. A uh, is a negation, just like in English, from Indo-European, you know, amoral, you know, anesthetic, you know, the a, uh, or an, in some cases is a negation. So, uh, uh, avidya literally could be ignorance, not knowing. But it's different. It's not just the not part is the main part. It's the knowing part. So you're knowing what is not the case that, as if it was the case. So I, there is an English word in the dictionary called misknowledge. Uh, which is very archaic, kind of. Nobody ever really uses it. Uh, they, they don't use it as a verb, misknow, which you can. Misknowledge is a noun. We use misunderstanding, miscomprehension, you know, a misperception. We can use mis with that as a negation in front of it. But we don't use it with knowledge, but we should. Because what the source of the whole problem is misknowing, which means Buddha thought he was Siddhartha that he was different from everything that was around him, that he was really Siddhartha, not just the name happened to be Siddhartha, of this process of a living being who's not completely different from everything else, who's interconnected with it. And there are some areas of difference and different kinds of difference. But within that, there's an overall oneness, actually. He didn't know that. And he misknew a wrong perception of himself. And this made him unhappy. Because you, it's a, a losing situation to be absolutely you in an absolutely other world that is not you, and that now and then mom is nice, and your beloved is nice, and your friend is nice, and something like that. But there's a lot of people who are not nice to you, and then you're scared of them, and, and then there's also germs, and there's wild animals, and there's time, old age, and your, there's a, your own stupid self. And so there's just so much going against you, you sort of lose the situation of you versus the universe, even though now and then you can be pro and have people being pro to you, and you can be pro to them in a small circle where you almost identify with them. It's like you can be one family, or you can be one community, or you can be one team, and you can kind of feel you've expanded your, the you that everything else is against. You can be one nation, you can be one mob, and feel powerful as a mob, and lose yourself in the mob and do things you wouldn't do as an ordinary person, either bad or good. Because you're actually very, f very flexible in self-identification. It's an act. It's a construction self-identification. It's not a fixed thing. And that's what you begin to learn when you unlearn feeling you're just absolutely you. Rigid identity. So he decided after, so, so he, 
He immediately saw what had been wrong with him up to that moment. Finally, he really knew. He knew it was the same thing that was wrong with most other people because he looked at them and he realized and he was, and not only looked at them, but he was one with them. Because when you're a Buddha, you identify with all of them and you feel you are the vast mass of life, including all the things around the living beings. He, th he knew it was the same thing that is wrong with most other people. So he decided, after waiting for the invitation from the powers that be, at first he said he wasn't going to talk about it, he was going to stay by himself in the garden of nature, in the forest. But that was just uh, what he felt like. He was expressing his feeling. He didn't want to impose on anybody because he knew that what he, he experienced was inexpressible, beyond expression. Uh, but and, th and then he also knew the condition of most of the other people, and that automatically made him, responding to their suffering, want to help them. But he knew the, the, efficient, the only effective way to do it would be if he started with the big boss. And the people in his culture there, they thought the boss was Brahma. The, some of them thought was the creator. Others who di didn't think he was creator but thought he was the principal god. Uh, so with the approval of him, that's when you can go and, and you can have a, make a proper, uh, proper impression on the people. Okay. I won't have that happen again. I hope that wasn't God calling. <laughs> so he decided after waiting for the invitation from the powers that be, namely the God of the day, great Brahma and company, that he would share his prescription and his therapeutic curriculum. So rather he was like a doctor, rather than he was a preacher, or rather than he was a prophet, or rather than he was a founder of a religion or a cult leader, he really was a doctor. He was going to give a, he saw by having healed himself, he saw what was wrong with everybody else. He automatically felt it because he actually only had healed himself when he realized the sameness of himself with everybody else. And therefore he realized their condition completely from within them, which I know sounds incredible. And, uh, but you just have to be open to infinity and you can realize it's possible. You have to remember some time when you felt you were one with your child or you were one with your lover or you were one with your parent or your friend or, you, or your teammate and you were just one being. You had these flashes that people have. And if you have that, then you realize it's possible within an infinity of life for someone to develop an, in, an unlimited empath empathy with other beings. So then you see they need a prescription, which is really a curriculum, a super education of how they themselves can find that infinite condition of bliss, blissfulness. And so his therapeutic curriculum. So his prescription, unfortunately, was not just any pill. It was not just a particular, it wasn't just Soma, the Vedic, the Vedic, the Vedic psychedelic that was existing in India at that time. That wouldn't have done it. It hadn't done it for a lot of Brahmins yet. Or it had been to give them some knowledge, but not the, not the Buddha knowledge. And so uh, it indeed hadn't even done it for Indra, who gives, gives, takes Soma himself. That's like Indra's like the Zeus type of God, the Odin type of God that the Indians had. And so it was a prescription and the, and the prescription involved a certain lifestyle change, a certain learning process, a certain psychological development process. He had previously meditated with a group of five ascetics. And so after a 49 day holiday, he went to see them. That holiday, by the way, is what is described in the Flower Ornament Sutra, where he suddenly, he manifested different presences in different levels of the cosmos, in the heavens and everywhere. And he, taught, and, and he didn't actually teach anything. He just manifested a presence. And then all kinds of bodhisattvas and other people came, other Buddhas came, and they all celebrated him from him, having become one with them as an infinite being. So after that, he went to see them. He first, his first five guys, he went, his former companions, to give them his prescription for mental and physical health, which he called the four Arya Satyas, 
or the Four Noble Truths, as people have translated, but I don't like it. Satya, I rather would say reality, and noble, I would say friendly. And then I throw in fun. And I, reality, and the, the less freighted and less heavy duty than reality is the word fact. And we think of a fact as a real thing within a, within the context of it being factual to ourselves and others. So the four friendly fun facts, I think, is really quite good for nowadays. Arya Satya in his day was, of course, perfect. He was a perfect teacher, absolutely the best. But I think now we need to think of them as facts. We think of them as fun. And we call them friendly because the, the reason he called them noble, by the way, is because they are, he knew, and he says right away, they are not factual for an ignoble person. And he considers an ignoble person not to be a low caste person. He feels there are noble people among the caste people, a lower caste people. A noble person is a selfless person. Selfless in the sense that, at least to some degree, they feel the life pulse of another is as important as their own life pulse. So they have a sense of equality with another. That's key. And, of course, excitedly, excitingly, for this time that we're in, among the genders of human beings, the women are way ahead on that plane of nobility. When you define nobility in that way, they are far ahead because they have the experience of sharing their body. As, not by be, trying to, because they want to be saintly. They didn't know <laughs> they're going to have to be saintly by having to have one, but because that just biologically happens to them. And they, and they manage to do it, which is a miracle because it's a really hard job. So, but that makes them more ahead in being aware of the, you know, having experienced the equality of themselves and another automatically. It does. So that puts them ahead on the enlightenment scale. He had previous, which is not really very happy idea for patriarchal chauvinists. They, won't, they don't like that. They, they didn't like that in Buddha's time. They still don't like that. They still, he had previously meditated with a group of five ascetics, and so, yeah, he went there. So he gave them the prescription, the Four Noble Truths. He called them noble truths because these things are true for someone who has achieved a degree of openness and sensitivity that enables them to empathize with others and feel a kind of noblesse oblige, a friendly responsiveness and responsibility to their needs. And they are not because of feeling that they are equally important as yourself. And they are not true for the ordinary self-enclosed, self-defensive, uptight, self-centered sort of person. Everyone who has not gone through some kind of opening experience. Generally, I would sadly say that since then, over the last few thousand years, we are most of us still stuck there at some point in that ordinary self-enclosed thing. So that's why he called them noble truths. We think of someone as noble when they are the best kind of friend. And these four truths are states of reality, facts of life, not just proposition. Yes, that's the other reason I don't like translating Satya as truth, even though it's okay. It's not wrong, but I don't like it. It's because truth has two meanings where it can be propositional truth or factual truth. You know, in other words, the truth that you say or the thing that you refer to, the fact itself. And whereas reality is the fact itself, or fact is the fact itself. It's not a cognitive, it's not a verbal proposition. Okay? So generally, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's why he called them, yeah, yeah. Not just, not just facts of life, those propositions. These four truths or friendly facts are still today a model for a good doctor's diagnosis. One, the recognition of the symptom. Two, the diagnosis of its cause. Three, the prognosis that gives us the likelihood and the nature of the cure, that's the prognosis. And four, the therapeutic method that counters the malignant effects of the cause. <laughs> that's right, that's the doctor's prescription. And it still is the doctor's prescription in even Indian medicine. Even though they don't think of themselves as Buddhists, it still is their, the pattern of a doctor's prescription in ancient Indian medicine. Four steps. Absolutely. 
And, that if you, and in a way, if there is any dogma in Buddhism, in the realistic worldview, it is that we accept as realistic a process of causation. And, and we didn't, now, nowadays, we don't think that's even a belief or anything. You don't have to believe in a causation. You know, you, you know I caused my knee to have a sting, stinging feeling because I slapped it with my hand, and my hand also feels a sting. And uh, that cuts the cause because I slapped it. So you know, we, that's not a big belief system thing. We don't think of that as a dogma. But the realistic worldview is sort of an acceptance. That's all that's required is an acceptance of, a pro, of the process of causality. And that isn't that. And it's historically, like I used to have a. Did I tell? I might have told the story here even. Uh, I don't know if I tell it in the book. But I used to have a colleague, he was actually the president of my college, classicist, and he used to give a speech at convocation and graduation about Western science, how great it is, that it came from Galen in Greece. The first, first example of someone thinking causally, instead of thinking the gods are in charge of everything and they make everything happen. And he talked about, he, 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 the story he told, used to tell was that uh, there was a ship filled with corpses that floated into Rhodes Harbor, I think. And then people started getting sick and uh, with a pox type of thing. And then everybody in the town ran to the temple of Athena or somebody or Asclepius and, uh, and, de and demanded they get rid of this plague. And Gal the doctor Galen, I think it was Galen, he went and he had the ship burned with the bodies because he realized that the germ was causing it, the plague germ was causing the sickness. And then from that, all the great edifice of Western science was brought up. So I ran up next to him. I, in those younger days, I jogged a little bit, and he jogged in the same place where we did. So after I first heard that, then my first, when I first arrived at that college, I went to him. And it wasn't when I first arrived. I was already there for a while because the previous president didn't give that speech. So I'm running along with him. And I said, that was really great how you put the source of science as the acceptance of causation, or the discovery of causation in Greece. <clears throat> but actually, therefore, it might interest you to know that one of the praises of the Buddha, one of the epitomes of the Buddha's teaching was, and then I recited in Sanskrit for him as we were running, which I'm sure he was overjoyed at, because he was a classicist in Greek and Latin. Anyway, om ye dharma hetu prabhava, hetun tesham tatagata hi abadat, tesham chayo nirodho evam badi mahasramaniye swaha. And then I said, of all those things that arise from causes, the realistic one said what were the causes and also how to prevent them. That is the philosophy or the teaching of the great uh, ascetic, of the great, the great, uh, uh, the great renunciant, Shramana. And wow, he said, really? And I said, yeah, that's in, people think approximately sixth century, I said, BCE. Oh, he said, I'll, I'll, I'll remember that. That's really interesting. And then I, he proceeded to give the same speech about the Greeks again and again for the next few years. And that's when I decided I needed to move to Columbia, to a graduate school from that college. But it took me a while to do it. Just from really just didn't fit in his view, so just forgot it, you know, and, uh, and kept his Western view, you know. Anyway. So the recognition of the symptoms, let me like break them out, these four. The symptom that plagues are unexamined and unenlightened life is our constant suffering. The suffering of change as our pleasures fade. The suffering of our pains themselves, such as birth, aging, sickness, and death. And the cosmic suffering of us thinking we are separate from the alien universe around us. So those are the usual three levels of suffering. And each one has a specific, uh, the, the cosmic suffering is particularly the one of the gods in heavens, gods and angels in heavens, gods and godlings in heavens, 
that's a cosmic one, and, um, and then the human level, the pains, birth, aging, sickness, and death. And then even our pleasures are suffering because they don't last. So, which of course indicates that they are a little bit pleasant for this first <laughs> second, few seconds, but they never mind, it's just broad strokes, okay? But that's what we complain about, that's our symptom. The diagnosis, number two, the cause of such constant suffering is our misknowing, knowing mistakenly that we are really real in ourselves and really separate from the world around us, which leads to the craving and the dread and anger, I should have said, engendered by the hopeless struggle of our small I, ego, against the huge everyone and everything other than me. That's pretty self-explanatory, I think. And, uh, the, the, but, but to be elaborated is the really real statement. My old Mongolian teacher used to say that all the time, and it was really right, really great. It, I, I learned it deeper and deeper and deeper as the years have gone on, since I was fortunate enough to meet him and study with him, where he said that people are not wrong when they think they're real. They are. The problem comes when they think they're really real. And at first when he said that, I, I thought it was kind of a joke. But what, what you mean by really real is where you exaggerate the degree of the reality, and, and then we could say you absolutize it. I don't think that is a verb in English, but it's except in, in my English. I'm making it into a verb, and it's going to become that. You absolutize it. You think of yourself, your reality, as an absolute, rather than knowing it's relational. That's a huge difference. Once you know it's relational, then you become more alert and tuned to what you relate with. And then you, you begin to wonder, well, what do I relate with internally? And then you become more introspective and you look at how your sense of self, your sense of your reality is constructed. And you begin to become, you begin the march toward enlightenment which is a scientific philosophic march. You don't have to be a philosopher and you don't have to be a scientist. We're all scientists. We're, we're the scientists who don't step out in the highway when the light is red. Because we've, we've investigated and we've explored and we know that red means don't go and we know there are other people going on, on, on the cross purposes to us or have a green light and they're zooming along and we'll be crushed if we step out there. So we are scientists. We're scientists when we cook, we're scientists when we, the way we walk, or how we sleep, how we exercise. We, we want to know what's real around us. So, so we don't want to misknow it. When we misknow, we think health and we think poison is medicine and we take it, we're going to die. So we don't want to misknow on those levels. Why should we care? Why should we not care about not knowing ultimate levels? Misknowing the ultimate reality of things. We shouldn't accept things on blind faith or without evidence or on somebody else's assertion. We have to know, we have to critique what we think we know. We don't believe what you think you know. We mustn't believe it. We could come to believe it if we find it confirmed by investigation, supported by facts, getting other, other people agreeing with our getting help of their view on it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, we, that's what you explore, and then you do accept some realities. We believe causation because it bangs into us all the time. <laughs> and, and, we, and when we're really real, of course, we feel there's some piece of us that's beyond all the thing that happens to us. We think there's something disconnected from everything. When Buddha critiqued the idea of the mortal soul as understood by religions, he didn't mean to critique the immortality, meaning that their life goes on, or the soulness, meaning that there's something very subtle that is, that is the locus, the core, of, the core locus of your identity. But he meant that it wasn't a fixed thing that is always changing and is disconnected from everything else, which is what you absolutize when you think you're really real. Like there's a little Bob Thurman homunculus that never changes, that's always in there. Maybe 16 or 20 years old when I thought I was really smart or something. I was fairly smart, but I thought I was really smart, really, really smart. That, so that was my misknowing, I'm one of them. Okay. Now the prognosis, number three, so that's one and two. 
and those are in the relative world, and, they, and it, which may turn out to be a kind of have an illusory quality about it. So not, those are the, neither the symptom nor the causation process that we've analyzed and described there is that none of, none of those are ultimately real. That's just a good way of describing them to try to get a hold of them in a relational way to try to cure them, cure, cure the suffering. That's all what it's about is curing the suffering. That's all that it's about. It's not about joining this or doing that or becoming the other thing. It's about curing the suffering. Three, the prognosis. And this is where you, got, you leave the doctor's office happy. <laughs> Fortunately, the prognosis is excellent as deeper examination leads to non-dual wisdom. Non-dual wisdom being the expression hallowed by early Christian Gnostics who got killed by Roman emperors for being Gnostics, unfortunately, all too often. But anyway, they felt they knew God. They knew the salvation. They knew the heavenly reality. They knew, and I'm sure some of them did. And what they thought of as God, they transcended seeing it as the local tribal personality. And they saw it as the love force of the universe, which would agree with what we call, the, which would be what we call clear light of the void. The infinite energy plane that I've talked about in the past. And I'm, I always jump to, but never mind, I'm not going into detail. But that's what he said. He said, fortunately, the prognosis is excellent. As deeper examination leads to non-dual wisdom, and wisdom is bliss, right? Because non-dual wisdom of knowing reality knows that that reality is bliss. Because bliss is everything you've ever wanted. Enjoying it to the full. Feeling filled up with whatever defect, defici deficiency you may have. At the deepest level, when we fully, that the universe is fully, fully for you. That the good guys are stronger. There may be some irritants here and there, but the good, that they're, that's just the people who misknow. People who are spreading their suffering at you. The power of the ultimate universe is for you. Life is for us. So that's really makes you happy. Should. At the deepest level, when we fully realize, in fact, that in fact the self, quote unquote, is utterly and harmoniously interrelated to everything other, we experience the blissful relief of total freedom from any kind of suffering. So in other words, we are one with everyone and everything. We love them, they love us. And even the trees like us. And the ground and the air and the water and the fire and the wind. They're all goddesses, actually. They're all female Buddhas. But never mind. That's, that's, that's elaborating. And the main point is, there's nothing against us. Even death is just a renewal of form. It's just a change of form. It's a chrysalis becoming a butterfly, hopefully, or no, rather than a chrysalis becoming something lesser, a, a, a uncrystallizing womb, or nerve, a worm. It's not that. It's not automatic, though, on the other hand. Four, the therapeutic method. Since it takes effort and time to transcend the superficial stress to reach the deep bliss of the really real, the effective therapy is an eight-lane highway on which to drive the great vehicle of the comprehensive super-education of our whole humanity, transforming and empowering our body, our speech, and our mind to discover who and what we really are and what they really are. That's Buddhahood, in other words. Isn't that fun? I love it. I don't know why my eye is bothering me. I love it. I really do. That's the therapeutic method. That's the Eightfold Path. This is your friendly doctor. And he wants you to lighten up and cheer up and have fun. And so that's what these four friendly fun facts are, these four noble truths. He's noble because he's friendly. He's noble as far as you're concerned because he's friendly. He has no bless oblige about you. That means he feels responsible that you have a better, that you have better situation that you be better, you feel better. That's what he wants. That's the right kind of doctor. And he has, he has a vision of your betterness, even. 
So he can really, he, he, ima he can imagine you at, at your best. So he sees the best in you. Ah, that you could say, he sees the best in you. That's the good kind of a doctor. Doctor comes and sees you as a bother, just wish he just had the money from <laughs> Medicare anyway without you. You're a, pe you're a pest. You ask annoying questions. You know, you're, he may feel he's gonna, he might feel he's going to catch your germ. That's not a good doctor. And he feels they're hopeless anyway. The good doctor is the one who sees the best in you. That is the best health. They see nirvana in you. They see your Buddha nature. So they know that it can come out. It's stronger than your superficial sickness. And you just need to correct your misknowing and your, mis, your misliving and your missleeping and your misbehaving. You will correct those things and you'll be really fine. He sees that. And so he gives you the prescription of how to do it, but which is unfortunately usually a kind of educational prescription. And that's what we'll come to in the next session when you really get that these are friendly, fun facts. And they're fun because you have a good outcome. They're fun because the method has been tried and true by millions, if not billions of people, maybe not billions because there haven't been billions in ancient time, but many, many hundreds of millions of people for sure, because the highly, most highly populated parts of the planet were Asia, and uh, the, this was widespread in Asia, even in Persia it was. Mani, Mani, who was Persian, you know, Manichaeism, tried to mix it with Christianity, and this was rejected by Western Christians eventually. But that was Buddhism. He, he considered Buddha as his, his teacher, Buddha, Zoroaster, and Jesus, all three. So that means it was prevalent in Persia for the, at the time of Mani. That's sometime after Buddha, but not long after. So it was everywhere in the ancient, most populated parts of the world, and a lot of people got benefit from it, and therefore it remained extremely popular, institutionally widely present, basically until we come down to the day of communism, <laughs> Where, and you know, materialism, which is a form of materialism that destroyed the idea of having a spiritual destiny, a spiritual reality, and so on. And, and, uh, and uh, that's where we are now. But um, so that's it. So now we dedicate the merit of this to uh, ourselves becoming nirvanized and enlightened and free of suffering so we can help others to free themselves from their suffering so we can pass on the therapeutic method not as a religion, not in conflict with any religion, fortunately, luckily, because humans are already very advanced, and that's why they wouldn't come up with something that would last that was too destructive. And so we want them to be equally enlightened as Jews, Christians, immaterialists, Muslims, Taoists, uh, Hindus, Shaivites, Vaishnavites, Shaktiites, whatever it is and uh, uh, Baha'i, Baha'ists, or any other kind, Kumarists. That's how we dedicate the merit. Quickly, let's get to a global happy world.